Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast, Podcast. where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 183. And this week, it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have? Well, Terry, something I keep meaning to tell you, and it's just popped into my brain, so I'm going to tell you before I forget again, which is a forward, pun intended, for this show, but we'll get to that in a minute. Toothpaste. Do you remember your episode about teeth and we talked about toothpaste? Well, on the back of that, I went to, I didn't actually go looking for natural toothpaste, but I was in one of these. I don't know if you, you must have those somewhere, but I don't know if you have one fairly locally that you use. It's a place where it's sort of anti packaging so they sell things loose so you know you can go and buy some almonds or some cinnamon powder or all sorts of things they have in there to get away from packaging so you can go and fill containers you can fill your um, washing liquid all sorts of things so I was in there they happen to have wasn't actually in there for any of those things they happen to stock an avocado oil mayonnaise which I know is very common in the States, but less common here. And they have one that's really delicious. So I'd gone in to get a little jar of that. And I noticed they had some natural toothpaste and they had it with uh, with and without fluoride. So I got some without fluoride. And, you know, we had this discussion about I was really wary of using them because I've got sensitive teeth and they don't seem to come in the sensitive type. But I thought, well, I'll give it a go and see what happens. And so I've been using it. And it, I know you mentioned that he talked about not using anything that had an abrasive material in it. And it does have, I think it's chalk powder, but I don't know if that counts as being too abrasive or not. I'm not sure. Other than that, it just has natural oils and things. It's got, you know, peppermint oil and and I think it's got some coconut oil or some kind of different oils in it. And um, I've been using it now probably for at least a couple of weeks. And I haven't had it at the start. I noticed some problems with sensitivity, but I haven't noticed any difference from before. So maybe your theory about ingredients of the toothpaste making my teeth more sensitive and therefore needing and you know going around in an endless circle were correct Uh, so we shall we shall see watch this space but I have converted I threw my chemical mouthwash away and my other toothpaste and so I'm on a natural toothpaste no fluoride or anything like that (laughs) very nice I don't know this, but I'm wondering the chalk may be similar to things that get added here, like diatomaceous clay, if I'm saying that correctly, diatomaceous earth. So it actually can be used not only as a thickening agent, but it actually helps with some of the cleaning too. And it's interesting that you brought this up and I'm interested to hear, you know, continued um, updates from you. But since that episode, I have flossed several times, uh-huh. not daily, <laughs> and I have used oil pulling a few times, again, not daily. So I too have been implementing some of this, not as consistently yet as I would like to, but definitely have had it a little more front in mind. Very good. So there you go. Quick update. <laughs> I'm sure everyone was just waiting with bated breath to see how we were doing with our teeth. (laughs) Absolutely. Or fresh scented breath. (laughs) That's right. Anyway, back to this week's episode. I am back with the Nudge podcast, which I've shared before, with the host Phil Agnew. And he is back with a guest called Tom Hutley, aka Tom the Taxi Driver. And the title of the episode is How Black Cab Drivers Memorize Every Road in London. Now, I don't know if you remember, it was you who had that episode about some memory tactics. Remember, it was very interactive, wasn't it? You got me to do things and vice versa. And I can't remember whether um, 
See, I keep doing it. I can't remember whether I did an episode with a different tactic or not. I couldn't remember or whether it just felt like I'd done an episode because you tested me and it was they were very interactive, weren't they? But either way, I do remember mentioning the knowledge. And so when I was looking through some different episodes to share with you, I came across this one. I thought, oh, it'd be quite nice to circle back to this topic, which we both found a lot of fun and tell you a bit more about the knowledge because I did mention it a few times. So Tom, the taxi driver, and he has his own YouTube channel, which apparently he set up during COVID to share some stories about taxi driving. And I think, and he now does some practical things. I I tuned in on one and he was, he was going around blindfolded, not driving. Somebody else was driving, but he was telling them what the route was blindfolded. Um, But uh, yes, Tom, the taxi driver took the knowledge. And so he's telling us a bit about it. And I found this Most people in the UK know about the knowledge. Every black cab driver has to take the knowledge to become a black cab driver. And it's been talked about a lot with bigger brains. Black cabbies have bigger brains. So it's all quite interesting. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail. But he tells us a little bit about the knowledge, which which I found quite interesting. And you might ask, you know, why not just use GPS? And he talks a little bit about that using a chef analogy, I seem to remember. But he basically says, you know, GPS is a tool they have at their disposal, but it's not a necessity because it's all up here in his brain. And that gives gives him much more flexibility. And the host is saying, so, you know, this is all about memory tactics. And he was saying that he's always used what he calls the brute force method when it comes to having to remember something. And we basically just crams it all at the last minute. And I think most of us have probably done that for exams in the past. I certainly have. And uh, it goes okay, but certainly not very well. Um, So the knowledge, what is it? When did it come about? Well, apparently it was started in 1851 during Queen Victoria's reign. And back in the day, it was the hackney carriages, so horse-drawn carriages. And the drivers apparently were a bit of a liability, quite often drunk, lots of accidents. So they brought in this formalized system and it takes ages to learn. Back in Victorian times, it would take a year or so. Now the average is two to four years. And it is a six mile radius of Charing Cross, which apparently is roughly the centre of London. So for anyone who knows London, where does that six miles extend to? Well, north, Alexandra Palace, south, Crystal Palace, Southeast, Lewisham, over southwest, Wimbledon, Chiswick to the west, Stratford to the east, Brent Cross, northwest, and Leighton, northeast. Just to give you, for those who uh, who know London geography a little bit, you get an idea of the reach. And they have to know every single street in that circle. But why six miles? He says that nobody's completely sure, but the old wives' tale was that when it was back in the days of the horse and carriage, that six miles was about the maximum that a horse could go before it needed to stop and rest. Other people say it might be something to do with the old police boundaries, but it is this range, which basically takes up most of Greater London. Greater London seems to keep getting extended, but basically it covers greater London. And for the knowledge, for this test, you could be asked for anywhere in that area, right down to the smallest, most obscure cul-de-sac. So you've really got to know it inside out. Uh, Apparently there's only a 40% pass rate. And it's not just the streets. There are apparently tens of thousands of landmarks that you need to know too. You know, all the obvious ones, but also anything you can think of. Hospitals, mosques, theatres, you name it. And you need to have a good topographical knowledge. What's going on? The knowledge examiner could ask you something like, well, I'm going to such and such a show but I'm not sure which theatre it's at. 
your black cabbie is expected to know oh yes so that's at the palladium or wherever and i'll take you there right now and the exam itself apparently is quite a formal event you're you're expected to turn up in formal attire and there's a map in front of you in between you and the examiner and you have to orally recite the routes they give you So they'll ask you, I want to go from A to B, and you have to call out every single street on that route. And apparently as you're doing that, there's a string on the map the examiner has that ensures that you take the most direct route possible. And that's known as the cotton. You've got to stick as closely as possible to the cotton. And he says it's about learning the map inside out not really how to be a taxi driver and they have four questions and apparently you start on a certain number of points and then they deduct as you go and they can deduct points for hesitation going a bit too wide of the most direct route etc etc and I can't remember how long it I think it took him three years either two or three years to get the knowledge but he says it's very character building and They're all very proud of their achievement. What an achievement it is by the sounds of it. So I I thought that was quite interesting because I hear the knowledge talked about a lot, but I found it quite interesting to hear some of the details. Phil talked about the difficulty of it and knowing how much it takes to acquire the knowledge, to pass the knowledge. He was saying that this makes a service more valuable and this is called a sunk cost bias. And this changes perception and behaviors. And he talked about a study where overweight women were invited to undertake a new therapy for weight loss. And they had to carry out unpleasant tasks like reading nursery rhymes aloud while the sound of their voice was played back to them after a short delay. So think of those really awful Zoom calls when you're getting that echo coming back to you. It's it's awful. A very, very off-putting. Now, half of the women had to do this for five hours. And the other half, the other group, for just 15 minutes. And both of them were told it would help reduce weight. Of course, it wouldn't. It's placebo. But it's amazing what you believe when you're told something by a professor in a white lab coat. Now, all of them were weighed one year later. The first group, those were the women who did the task for five hours, lost an average of 6.7 pounds. The second group, just the 15 minutes, they only lost an average of 0.3 pounds. So this is the sunk cost bias. The more that goes into it, the more effort, the higher the cost, the more likely you're going to want to stick to whatever it is. You're going to want to be able to justify the outcome. So how did he memorize the knowledge? Quite a big task. He says he he doesn't have any kind of special memory. He hasn't got a photographic memory or anything like that. It's just an average person. But he did use some tactics. And Phil, after recording this podcast, was inspired to try some of them out himself and learn all the capital cities of the world. Do you know how many capital cities there are in the world? I have no idea, but after watching the Olympics opening ceremonies, I think it's quite a few. (laughs) That goes on forever. Apparently it's 202. So what did he do? Most people start with what's known as blue book runs. And apparently there are around about 300, 320 of these. And these are just an arbitrary list of different runs. So different journeys from A to B. He says, if you take each of the start and finishes of these runs and you have a quarter mile radius of all of those, they start overlapping. He says this is known as the dumbbell effect. And so straight away, it becomes more manageable of a task. So you start off learning these blue book runs rather than thinking, I've got to learn 25,000 streets. You start with these, but actually by learning those because they 
a lot of them overlap with this quarter mile radius of all the starts and the ends. You actually, by doing that, you're learning more than you think. So breaking things down into more manageable chunks. And he cites somebody called Katie Milkman, who's written a book called How to Change. And she talks about a study. It was volunteers for a charity and they were asked to commit to 200 hours a year. And apparently after um, six months, there was quite a lot of drop off in the time that they were volunteering for. So she decided to change the expectation or alter it. So she dropped the chunks down to smaller commitments like four hours a week. So it was actually the same amount of time overall, but it was more manageable chunks. And they improved the volunteer rate by 8%. So this blue book gives you a good start and then you you apparently you move on to something called point to point, which is a bit more precise. That's really is the first tactic is breaking things down into manageable chunks. And he says with this blue book, what you do is you drive them, you physically drive the different routes, you map them out on a map and then you call them out every day. This orally reciting the route. So, you know, street by street, you call it out. And he says, this gives you fluency. So you're repeating. It's a bit like a phrase book for a new language, learning by repetition, but not any old repetition, but spaced repetition. And this is the second tactics. So it's repetition, but they're spaced in time. And this produces stronger memories than putting all that time together. So instead of doing something solidly for a day, spacing it out, you know, half an hour every day, whatever, but spaced repetition, really important. But why? Why does it work? And again, talking about different studies, there was a a study where they had some EEG data. So they're looking at the brain and apparently there was increased activity in the frontal part of the brain while they weren't doing the repetition. So in those spaces in between, if you're just doing it all in one chunk of time, the brain gets very fatigued. So if you're just studying for hours on end, your brain gets really tired. And he cites some other studies that have shown the same thing for exams and studying for exams. Uh, you do a lot better with spaced repetition. And then he goes on to talk about Tom, the taxi driver, that is, points of interest. And he says he likes this tactic because it's quite visual. So he can think about different visual cues to help learn the various routes. This is what I do when I'm looking up. I'm really old school when I need to know how to get somewhere. I tend to look it up on Google Maps and I will quite often go into Street View and sort of have a look and think, oh yeah, okay, so I need to look out for that pub. That's where I turn left and look out for this so that, you know, when you're driving and you're focusing on what you're looking at all around you and you pick up these different landmarks and it's a way that that I find it easier to remember routes. So I wasn't surprised that it was something that, that he did as well. This is the third tactic building associations and links. And this really taps into some of the techniques that that you shared in that previous episode. Um, And he talked about how he's become really interested in the history of London. And he said this really helps trigger names of, of streets and things and helps him build up links. And he gave an example of a journey around Bank Junction. And there's a street called Threadneedle Street and Threadneedle Street apparently has the Guild of Merchant Tailors. So he said straight away, tailors threading the needle, Threadneedle Street. So you remember the tactics Mm -hmm. uh, that you shared before. You can see how he's building these associations. And as they often do, Phil, the host, cites studies to back up some of the things they're talking about. He mentions someone called Wendy Suzaki, who's written a research paper about these building these associations and links and how the brain forms new memories, specifically how the brain links unrelated things. 
And she found that neurons in the hippocampus changed their activity to improve memory. They only did this when associative memory was used. Um, so it helps us grow our hippocampus and improve memory. This circles back to London cabbies having bigger brains and they, they have studied this and they do. There was a big study done ages ago, apparently, but it's been it's had a bit of a reboot because they're wanting to find out if it can help with things like Alzheimer's. So London cabbies who have to do this incredible test, the knowledge, have a larger hippocampus. And with Alzheimer's, this is the part of the brain that tends to shrink. So you can see how studying the two together, it might be something that they could discover some earlier warning signs and things like that. So they're having a bit of a reboot of this looking at uh, London cabbies' brains or even proactive. Yes, exactly. How can we keep people's hippocampus growing and developing versus starting to deteriorate? That's fascinating. Exactly. So basically, Tom used those three tactics. Number one, he broke the task down into manageable, more manageable size chunks. Number two, he spaced out his repetition. They talked about the importance of repetition for learning, but really important that you space out that repetition. And number three, built associations. He did just throw a fourth one in there and, and that was sleep. And he was thinking when he had to do this, he thought, well, maybe because he was, you know, he was working full time and trying to do this at the same time. And he thought, well, maybe if he cut down a little bit on sleep, he would have that bit more time to study. And it just so happened at the same time, Matthew Walker's book on sleep came out and he listened to that and had a bit of a rethink about that idea. Um, so he really appreciates the importance of sleep as a productivity boost. And they talked a little bit about some a study that Matthew Walker did about pulling all-nighters and then having to remember facts and basically cut a long story short 40 percent less likely to be able to cram facts and make new memories if you've uh, gone without a night's sleep so as i mentioned at the beginning this all inspired phil to learn the 202 capitals of the world so he did that using these different techniques and then tested himself um, his partner read out the capitals and he had to say which country. And apparently he did that by doing just 10 minutes every night using some app or other. So spaced repetition for around two weeks. I think he said overall it was it was only about four hours in total. And he used the associated links tactic as well to help him remember them. And he did the test, and apparently you can see it on YouTube, all 202 of them, but he got them all right. So there you go. That's fascinating. So as you were talking, this is a topic that always just interests me. And I was thinking about some memorization tests in some ways that I've gone through over the years. It made me think first, I don't remember what grade I was in, maybe elementary school or middle school, I don't remember, but we had to come up with a science experiment. And I know probably every U.S. movie or show you've ever watched, Daisy, if they have kids, they have a big science project and the parents are always building the yeah. project and the kids getting the credit or whatever. But I remember my topic was chunking information to memorize things. So, for example, in the U.S., telephone numbers, there's a three-digit area code, mm -hmm. then three digits, and then four. They're chunked. What I did in this experiment is I had people memorize a list of numbers. If I'm remembering correctly, it had something to do with age also. At a certain age, they could remember this many numbers and at this age, but it was chunked information was really how we remember more easily. So... I'm fascinated now listening to these examples and thinking, ah, I did understand something way back then. And then the association piece reminds me of, again, elementary school. 
my family had a, a set of cards and I, I think they had to do with a TV video game at the time called Odyssey, but maybe I'm mistaken about that. But they were cards and the goal was that you would learn all of the U.S. state capitals. And I knew I needed to learn that. I don't remember, like I said, maybe it was fourth grade geography or fifth grade or sixth grade or something. I knew I was going to need to know these. So I started studying these cards. And to this day, I still remember some of them. For example, face to face, cheek to cheeka, the capital of Kansas is Topeka. (laughs) So you would remember them based on this Maybe this isn't the association, but making them into this, you know, little ditty or something that would help you to remember it. I think I had to take a test on this, so I I probably had to say these things pretty quickly in my mind. But memorizing those cues helped me remember data that otherwise was not associated to anything. Like, I don't know the capital of Maine, but if I can say the, the little ditty then I had it. So I just really enjoyed listening to you talk about this. Now, I don't think I would make it as a cabbie in London based on the number of things I would have to memorize, as you said. But I do think that's really fascinating that their brains are larger. And I could imagine maybe some ego getting in there and like, well, my brain was superior anyway. But the fact that their brain is bigger because they've done this strategy, they've yeah. had to grow their brain to learn all of this. It's really interesting stuff. So there's surface level interests of just like, wow, how do they do that? And then what can be learned from the fact that they can do that? That's really cool. No, exactly. It's, it is fascinating. I did find it interesting to just learn a bit more about it. Absolutely. Like I say, it's so... It's so well known and, you know, there are all sorts of issues that have gone on with the influx of sat-navs and Ubers and all these things. But it's, you know, black cabbies, are, they are really iconic and it is, it is quite incredible. You know, you could give them a really obscure little, I think, I think he was talking about one of his tests that they asked him, some really tiny, obscure little cul-de-sac in the back of nowhere. But... They've got to know them all. It's quite incredible. Yeah. 25,000 streets and another, you know, tens of thousands of various landmarks and buildings. And yeah. Plus, like you said, even knowing what show is yeah. playing at what theater. Impressive. Um, really, not only did you learn this information once, but there's some of it that updates frequently and they have to be up to date. That's amazing. And I've certainly found when I have really applied myself when I did that science exam a few years back and the learning I did for that I did it much more you know how you're supposed to do it you know more little and often and circling back and repeating summarizing things down testing yourself talking out loud doing all various things making associations you know talking to yourself as if you're giving a presentation all these things they do work Mm -hmm. but they also quite often just take time you know you couldn't do the knowledge quickly you couldn't cram for it the fastest you're going to do it is two years it takes a long time so it's not really surprising that your brain does grow a bit (laughs) to be, you know, to be putting that much stress on it in a, in a good way, but putting that much stress on it consistently for that, that length of time. I mean, you know, it's like going to the gym to build your, you know, build your muscles. It's, it's the same thing, isn't it? But it's, it's a fantastic thing to be able to grow your brain. So like you say, yeah, what can we learn from it? Yeah doing things on a slightly smaller scale (laughs) maybe and as you just described that again that reminder that this is why cramming really isn't effective you can't grow your brain overnight and expect it to last like you're cramming things trying to hang it on little hooks just long enough to to use it for that exam versus really integrating the information and growing the brain 
can't do that overnight. You can't do that in a weekend. So again, a reason why I don't think I'd be well cut out to be a cabbie in London because the two to four years, whew, that's a big commitment. It's a big commitment. But there you go. That's the sunk cost bias for you. Very good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there you go. It's good to challenge your brain cells a bit and try and memorize some things. Might be good for your brain long term. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, until we meet back here again for next week's episode, I hope you have a very wonderful week. Take good care, everybody. Bye.